Well, it was in March of 1911 at the annual banquet of the Syracuse Advertising Men's Club. I know everybody already know what's going on there, don't you? There we go. It was there that a phrase was coined that has been used ever since, a phrase that is American in origin that has then permeated all throughout the world, and it's a phrase that we all know. You see, at this journalism club, at this advertising club, they were looking for ways to advertise better, I guess, is what you do at advertising clubs. Talk about ways to get more ads out there and have people respond to your ads. And it was there that someone said, really in passing, didn't really think anything of it. And they told this group of journalists, they said, in your advertising, use pictures for a picture is worth a thousand words. Isn't that amazing? I've heard that before. Yeah. I've never heard of the Syracuse Advertising Men's Club, but I've heard of that saying. You see, it's it's telling us that within a picture, there is great, great power. An image of something happening does much more than simply hearing a description or a bullet point presentation or anything like that. For example, I could tell you about the 1936 Olympics, they were held in Berlin, Germany, and old Adolf Hitler, he wanted to use that as an opportunity to show the supremacy of the Aryan race. And I could tell you that there was an American by the name of Jesse Owens who thought he had other ideas about that. Or I could show you a picture. Put that first one up there, will you? That's not the picture. <laughs> we built up, we built up to the climax, now we're, now we're losing it. We're getting there, don't you worry. The anticipation, it's getting even bigger right now. For our live stream folks, just fast forward, you'll be all right. Is it working or no? Boom! Just like I said, right on cue. Only the best here at Center Point Church. That's what we do, okay? Right here, we have Jesse Owens. He won four gold medals that year. And the guy, I, th- I can't really tell from the picture if he's in second or third, but he is doing, German athlete, doing his due diligence to salute the Fuhrer. There's a lot of power in this picture. There's a lot that's conveyed about a clash of cultures, a clash of values, in one simple picture. Another example could be this. Go ahead and put the next one up there. Tiananmen Square. What does this tell us about the power of one individual, about the amount of change that one person can do? What does this tell us about how fragile a seemingly totalitarian regime really is? What does this picture tell us just about life itself? You know, the events of this past century, for example, even the Vietnam War, we've had wars since the dawn of time. But the reaction to Vietnam was so different because now, for the first time, we're seeing it as it's actually happening all through the 60s and the 70s. Picture is worth a thousand words. Maybe for something more contemporary, something that addresses a common temptation in our society. Go ahead and put that third one up there. What do you see going on here? Family dinner. There's, I like you, Don. <laughs> We've taken the ideal of the family dinner, you know, all kinds of studies to say, you know, the family that eats together stays together, we'll have family dinner, that's important, let's do it. And then to help us get through that time together, we're going to be distracted by work, by emails, by social media, by angry birds. I have no idea what they're doing on there. Maybe something very important. But what is that boy seeing? What is he thinking? What is he feeling right now? A picture is worth a thousand words. You go ahead and take that down. Images have great power to convey meaning, to convey purpose. Images can change this world. And it's not just images that come from a camera. It's not just images that come from the news media, from journalism, from any of that stuff. There's even images within Scripture that convey great meaning to this world. And we see this all the way back in Genesis. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God knows the power of a picture. God knows the power of an image. A picture is worth a thousand words. And so God has his images, his pictures roaming around this world. You see, it's often said, and it's very true, that we are created in God's image. And then we have to ask, well, what for? I think one reason that God created us in his image was so that we would bear images of God everywhere that we go. Another way to say that would be like this. God created us in his image so that we might join him in creating good in this world. When we often talk about bearing the image of God, we think of raising children. And that's one implication. That's a major implication. But another implication is how we live our lives, how we interact with each other, the things that we do with our time and with our money. Are they creating an image of God for the world to see? Now, one amazing way to create an image of God For everyone around us to see, one way to paint this picture, this picture that's worth a thousand words about the love of God, the beauty of God, the majesty of God, the power of God, it's through a simple action that we can all do. It's through serving. You see, we reflect God's love when we serve each other. As we gathered yesterday for Four Columbia, Yes, my group, we gathered together and we cleared out vines and tree stumps and whatever else from this vacant lot. And other groups went through and helped people with laundry, helped people who couldn't keep up with their apartments to clean, to take trash out, things like that. Still, other groups went and spread mulch. Other groups delivered food. Other groups gathered together and prayed. All of these different things were happening at the same time. But there was something even bigger than all of that happening. Images of God were being created all over the city, and all over this region. Because as we were out clearing land so they could place a park there whenever that's going to happen, people see that. They care about this area. As this other group was inside Oak Tower, caring for the residents there, providing just meeting physical needs, cleaning laundry for them. Well, why would someone care enough to come and wash my clothes? As we're sitting together and talking over lunch, Well, why are they spending their Saturday afternoon here? And there's all kinds of other things they could do. All of that is creating an image of God for this world to see. A picture, a picture is worth a thousand words. Now, Jesus, he makes this connection explicit, by the way. Jesus makes this connection between our identity with God and the images we create The fact that we're made in God's image to bear images of God. Jesus makes this connection so clear that you can't have one without the other. Jesus says we cannot step into our identity as family members, as sons and daughters of the king, unless we are creating images of God. They go hand in hand together. And I want you to see this. And there's a chance, by the way. Yesterday I spent a good majority of the morning taking out vines and clearing out branches. And so today, I want to show you this from a scripture that talks all about vines and branches. If you have your Bibles, open them up. In John chapter 15 is where we're going to be. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Starting in verse 1, Jesus is speaking here. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Jesus is anchoring our identity within him. He is the vine. 
We are the branches. Over and over again, as we're clearing out this lot, you would find what looked like just a little stick, a little log on the ground, and you would try to pull that thing up. And then as soon as you start pulling, you realize there's hundreds of vines that have grown all over it and through it. And those vines are holding on so strong, you couldn't lift that log even if you tried. And I tried a lot. We had to go and get all kinds of snippers and other things to cut it through so that we could get that log out of there. Vines are incredibly strong. Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. Also, when we were clearing out this lot, there's all kinds of trees there, and all these vines wrap around the trees and grow all the way up. And there's no way we could get those vines off the trees. And so what the leader of the group, what he said to do, he says, just cut the vine. Let it be, cut the vine, and it'll die. Give it enough time, that vine will die, and it'll fall on its own. Church, Jesus is the vine, and we are the branches. If we sever our connection with Jesus, eventually we're going to die. And then we will fall. Jesus is the life source. He is the one that breathes within us. We have no power, no life itself apart from Jesus. He is the vine. We are the branches. Now this analogy, by the way, from yesterday, it breaks down at one key point. You see, all those vines that were holding the logs together had grown through the fence, holding it all together. All those vines that were going up the tree, and we just cut and removed or cut and let them die. This is where the analogy breaks down. Because there is nothing that can cut us off from the vine of Christ. Jesus' love for us, Jesus' hold on us is so powerful, is so strong. No one can come through and sever that vine. What shall separate us from the love of God? Absolutely nothing. See, we hold on to Jesus, and we hold on as strong as we can, all the while knowing it's Jesus who's holding on to us. He is the vine, and we are the branches. This is so vital to know. We have to know our identity within God. Everything else flows out of our identity. If we find our identity with God, we'll find sourceness, we'll find life, we'll find abundance, we'll find everything that we need. We'll be able to say, it is well with my soul. If we find our identity anywhere else, be it a job, be it a relationship, a family, a hobby, if we find our identity anywhere else, it will fail us, oh church. It will let us down. But Jesus, he's the sure one. Now you might be wondering, what in the world does this have to do with serving? I'm glad you asked. I asked for you. That's what I do. So, what this has to do with serving is this. When we understand our identity, then we understand how to move forward on this mission that God has given us. You see, last week we began this series entitled On Mission. We just finished as a church going through Mark's gospel and looking at our journey with Jesus. We saw Jesus died for our sins. We saw that he was resurrected, giving life to absolutely anyone who would seek it. Anyone who would join with Jesus on his journey can have eternal life because of the resurrection. And then we saw Jesus. He gave the church, he gave his early followers a mission just before he went to heaven. And this mission still remains. Last week we saw that the first step in living on mission as followers of Christ is to obey the Great Commission, is to make disciples, to tell people about Jesus, to teach them how to follow Jesus. The first step of that is what's called evangelism. Remember we talked about saying worship is bragging about God to God, while evangelism is bragging about God to people. There's another step in making disciples. Besides telling people about Jesus, we show them Jesus through our lives, through our service. A picture is worth a thousand words. Even in ways that might not seem clearly to be, quote, evangelistic, service, creating that image of God, it's worth a thousand words. And Jesus, he makes this connection clear. This isn't just something that I'm making up, like everything else, I suppose. But no, 
Jesus makes this clear. Look at verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Some of your translations might say abide there, abide, remain. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Some branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. What do branches naturally do when they have life? They bear fruit. They show that they are connected to the vine. As followers of Christ, as we are connected to Jesus, we bear fruit. What does that mean? What does that look like? That means we create images of God everywhere we go. That people see that image and they're reminded of God. He says if we don't remain, if we're cut off from the vine, what's going to happen? The same thing we did with all those branches that we cut off from the vine. We threw them in a pile, and they got picked up and hauled off to a landfill or a mulch site, something like that. Apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And notice, by the way, notice what he says in verse 7. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Bearing fruit is bathed in prayer. We cannot bear fruit apart from prayer. That is right along, that's the main way that we bear fruit, is connecting through God, or to God through prayer. And then we take that with us as we continue. <laughs> Remain in me. This is nothing to sneeze at. This is good stuff right here. <laughs> Jesus says, Remain in me as I remain in you. You know, we have a beautiful picture of that. We see elsewhere in the scripture. Paul writes, he says, Do you not know? that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. When we really understand what it means that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, how much must God love us? to make us the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you read the Old Testament, if you read in Kings, if you read in the prophets where they built the temple in all of its splendor, everything's paved in gold and it's so high and it costs so much money. We're talking thousands of pounds of gold were used to build this temple. And God saw it. And he says, you know, I've got a better temple in mind than that. Each one of you gathered here. God looks at you and he says, I'd rather have my spirit there than in any temple built with gold, decked out in jewels, anything else. How much must God love us? You know, we have, just observing the culture for a minute, we've got a whole group within our culture that hates themselves, that hates their bodies, I think something's wrong with me. God made a mistake when he made me. If we're honest, we've all wrestled with that at one point in time or another. Or we beat ourselves up and we talk about all the ways that we've messed up. You know, if we really understood that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that when God looks at us, he doesn't see all those faults and failures. We could come up with 10 or 20. And if God wanted to, he could point out a lot more. Let's be real for a moment. We've forgotten so many ways that we've messed up. But God looks at us with all the things that we hate about ourselves, with all the different areas that we say are ugly. He looks at us with all of our fault, with all of our failure, all the guilt, all the shame that we carry. God looks at us and he says, I want my Holy Spirit there. Jesus, the Bible tells us in the New Testament, Jesus says that he is not ashamed to call us his brother or his sister. 
And we might say, oh, Jesus, if you really knew me, you might be ashamed. Jesus knows. He is unashamed to call us his brother and his sister. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. As we grow in our identity of connecting with God, of receiving his love, of being a very temple of the Holy Spirit, not only does that help us see God better for who he is, it helps us see each other better for who we are. You see, every person you've ever met has been made in God's image. Every person you've ever met has been loved dearly by God. Every person you've ever met has been redeemed, bought for a price by Jesus himself. Every person you've ever met, the Holy Spirit wants to live within them. It doesn't matter how broken, how rough around the edges they are. God loves them dearly. And sometimes we might say, God, you need to reach this one. I need help with this one right here. And sometimes God responds, I am reaching them. And then he looks right back at us. Go. Create an image of God with them. Paint a picture of my love for them. When we know our identity, O oh church, we naturally bear fruit. We can't stop it. It's not like a branch on that vine decides whether or not it's going to grow. It doesn't decide if it's going to bear fruit that day or not. It just naturally happens. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 9. Jesus is still speaking. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. We could spend the whole time just meditating on that. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from the Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love one another. You know, I remember when I first started following Jesus, when I'm reading through the scripture the first and second time or whatever it was, and come across this, and you read where Jesus says, if you keep my commands, then, you're in love, or then you are with me. Greater love has no one than this. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. There it is, verse 10. And I remember thinking, well, Jesus, that's pretty manipulative if you ask me. If one of you were to go to your spouse and say, well, honey, if you loved me, you'd keep my commands. <laughs> How's dinner going that night? That's all I'm going to ask. It's not going to go well. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. What came to me is he's not giving us this manipulative, I'm trying to control you. You know, well, if you really loved me, then you would do this and this and this. Jesus is just making a matter-of-fact statement. If you love me, if you love me as the God of the universe, as the King of kings, as the Lord of lords, if you love me as your forgiver and your leader, it'll be shown because you'll naturally walk along with my heart. You'll naturally grow just a little bit more like me every single day. And I say naturally because it's not like we have to force it and we can't fight against it. It just naturally happens. As we are connected to the vine, we bear fruit in keeping with Jesus. He says, a way to know, as you love me, as you grow in your love for me, you're naturally going to do the things that I love to do. Bless and love. And you really, he makes this clear. 
Verse 11, I have told you this so that. Why did he tell us this? So that he can control us. So that he can create a little army that'll go and do whatever it is armies do. So that. None of that stuff. He says, I've told you this so that my joy may be within you and that your joy may be complete. Do you want joy? Walk with Jesus. Do you want joy in your life? Focus on God. One time I went through as I read the Bible and underlined every time I saw the word joy or rejoice or be joyful, something within the word joy, it's all over the place, O church. God is deeply concerned that we experience joy to the fullest. God created us to pursue joy, and he did it on purpose because perfect joy is found only with him. If we think there's better joy someplace else, oh, we're settling. We're trading something great and amazing for something lesser, even if we don't know it. Now look at verse 16 with me. Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. We have our identity. He's the vine. We are the branches. Our very life is to be found in Jesus. Why? So that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you, bathed in prayer. This is my command, love each other. Now, all through here, when John is writing about love, when Jesus is talking about the love of God as God has loved me, so I have loved you, he uses a very specific word. See, in the original language in Greek, there are several different words that are translated as love, and they all have different nuances and different meanings and apply in different situations. In this one, he uses a form of the word agape. Agape is the highest love. Agape is the divine love, comes from God to us. We cannot have agape apart from God. It comes from God to us and then is extended to each one around us. Agape starts with God, comes through ourselves, and then is extended to this world. C.S. Lewis, he described agape like this. He said that it is a passionate commitment to the well-being of the other. Agape is love in action. It was agape that took Jesus to the cross 2,000 years ago. It was agape that brought Jesus out of that tomb in the resurrection. It's agape. Every time someone turns their life to Jesus, and Jesus says, this one's my brother. They're my sister. It's agape that moves God to any time a person confesses, any time a person repents, any time a person turns to him, it's agape that moves God to say, you are forgiven and you are mine. It's agape. And Jesus says, take this in love, this agape, and love each other. In the same way as I have loved you, go and love one another. Now, when Jesus says there's no higher love to lay down one's life for one's friend, he's preparing his disciples for the cross. He's not saying to us, if we truly love someone, then we'll go and we'll lay down our lives. For some... That happens. This is a fallen, this is a broken world. But for many more of us, the much more common occurrence is we're not going to show agape love in that way. Instead, we're going to show it another way. We're going to show it by telling people about Jesus, by serving them in great, great ways, by creating images of God wherever we go. Now, I want to share another image with you Except this time, it's a living image. It's the image of someone who has received that agape and love through Fort Columbia, and then has since, over the past few years, been able to step in and to share that love with others going through similar situations. And so, church, I've invited Carissa up to the platform, and church, let's welcome her. There she is. Come on up here, Carissa. There we go. Right back here. The lights are goofy. You got to stay in the back. Oh. See? Yeah, there you go. Welcome to my world. Okay. Well, 
I had my bathroom floor replaced and a yard makeover in the front and backyards by Fort Columbia in 2018. Receiving a new bathroom floor when I was just needing a portion of the floor replaced showed that this was a way of God taking care of me once again. I had no idea that my yards were getting loved on until right before the Fort Columbia day. I felt loved that whole day, and I am still reminded of God's love when I see my floor in flower beds every day. I sat in the middle of the bathroom floor the night it was completed and cried. I was relieved that I did not have a rotten floor, and that I was, um, and I was also overwhelmed knowing that I had so many people from different churches taking care of Trey and I, especially after the lunch break when many others came knowing a home of a single mom needed more help. Again, I felt loved. After receiving our blessing from Fort Columbia, Trey and I wanted to give back. In 2019, Trey and I helped at the Mary Lee Johnston Community Learning Center by clearing out brush. Um, and I did, I got poison ivy doing that, so <laughs> I, I, I'll never do that. <laughs> Please. Yes, it is. Planting flowers and spreading mulch. In 2021, Trey and I helped a single mom by cleaning up her huge backyard and cleared a flooded area where she had stored um, dog crates and straw for her dogs that she had watched. Um, this year, Trey um, obviously wasn't able to. He's finishing his sophomore year um, this week. So I went to Memorial Baptist um, helping distribute the Jersey Mike sandwiches and Chick-fil-A's to be delivered to the volunteers. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I have two favorites with giving back from um, Fort Columbia, to Fort Columbia. Being able to work aside so many people from different churches, I love how the community works together and I feel that God's love is shining through Columbia when this happens. Um, my second is helping another single mom. Because I understand the stress and worry when something needs to be taken care of. Also, I've experienced being loved on and I want so many single moms to experience that too. It was so rewarding helping this single mom and was so amazing to know how much our work helped her mark so many things off her list. She also had a flower and vegetable garden where she told me it was her getaway, but it needed to be cleaned up. It was not on the list, but I wanted it to be, I wanted to be able to help her not stress over that area. I got, obviously, you know me, I got teary clearing up the dead plants and rose bushes because I was able to help bless her. I did not get to finish cleaning the area, but she was tickled to not have to do all of it herself. Um, when I was talking about my experience just a couple of minutes ago, receiving from Fort Columbia, I mentioned um, a few times that I felt loved. I wanted to tell you a quick story that I have told no one, but I felt it fits in. And this is good. <laughs> Four days before my dad passed away, my dad and I were in the living room. And while in a soft, after a while, in a soft voice, he called my name. I looked up and he said, you are loved. We both had shaking chins, but those words spoke, those three words spoke volumes and nothing else needed to be said. After playing this over and over in my head for a year and a half, I still don't think he meant that he, I am loved just by him. He had seen I have been taken care of by not only my friends and family, but also my God, my church, and my community. I think he knew I, he did not need to worry about me because I am loved and blessed by many times in the past, and I still am. Let me ask you, do you think that crew that came through and replaced the floor, what do you think they thought they were doing? 
Do you think they were communicating all of that? Probably not. They probably thought they were replacing the floor. That way people can walk around. When we serve, O oh church, we create images of God in this world. And that was, how many years ago was that, Carissa? Four years ago. And I've got a sneaking suspicion that will stay with you forever. Absolutely beautiful. And then, Carissa, if I can brag on you for a moment. I didn't ask permission. Sorry. <laughs> Forgive me in advance. She's now able, connecting with Love Columbia, has walked through a financial class with them, and is now in a position where she's leading other single moms through that class as well. It's good to help them get their stuff together. <laughs> now, helping a group of people to be able to manage money, to have a budget, to know what to do when the check comes in and take care of all their stuff, that's vital. That's so important. That's a great need in this country, in this world. There's something much bigger going on in those meetings. There's something much bigger going, than going through just simply, all right, you brought in this much, spend this much, and you'll be all right, and save and give and all of that. What's happening in those meetings? An image of God is being created Amen. right there. Right. What an impact that'll have on that next woman, and what is she going to do with it in the years to come? Oh, it's amazing to see. Church, Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. He says, as I have loved you, go and love one another. Put love in action. Yes, that means pray together. That means worship together. That means tell people about Jesus. Sometimes that means replace a bathroom floor or help make lunches for everybody or clear out a vacant lot or whatever it is. We don't want to get caught up in this mindset that says, well, serving, serving was great with Fort Columbia. When's the one next year? And then I'll serve. What can we do today? This is the day the Lord has made. So what do we do with all this? Let me encourage you with something. Pray. Remember, this is all bathed in prayer. And pray something really specific and really simple. Lord, how can I join you in creating good today. And you know what will happen? He'll answer. Now, the clouds might not part and the angels might not descend. You might hear this audible voice. You might not hear that that says, go volunteer at the school or whatever it is. You know, schools need volunteers. But what will happen in the way that God tends to answer is that all those needs that are around you, you'll notice them. We have so many opportunities to live on mission, church, all around us every day, and we miss the most of them. But when we pray, Lord, how can I join you in creating good today? Those opportunities are still there, and we see them. It might be an opportunity to pray for someone. It might be an opportunity to hug someone that's getting beat up by the day. It might be an opportunity at work to help clean the break room, just to bless the people that are there. It might be an opportunity when you see your neighbor's leaves are getting piled up to rake them for or to take the trash out or whatever it is. It might be an opportunity just to make a simple phone call to a homebound individual to let them know that we haven't forgotten them. All these opportunities are simple, but they mean so, so much more. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Let's go and bear fruit together. Worship band, come up here. Church, join me in prayer. I know that as we gather, I know that as we talk about our identity, the very essence of who we are, about our spirit, the Bible calls this our spirit and our heart, kind of synonymously, meaning the, the very essence of who we are as people. When we talk about this, we say that our essence, our spirit, is to be found within Jesus. We are, he is the vine and we are the branches, that we are connected with him. It's so easy for us to hear that and to look at our spirit, to look at our heart. And the first thought that comes to mind is, oh, my heart is ugly. The first thought that comes to mind 
is Jesus loves me greatly, and oh, have I failed him. Or how I have not lived up to his love. Or maybe this is you, maybe you're thinking, oh, how I failed as a parent, how I failed as a friend, how I failed as a worker, whatever it is. But remember, those aren't our identity. Our identity at the very essence is not being the perfect parent, the perfect friend, the perfect worker, the perfect neighbor, the perfect whatever. Our identity is being a child of God. And we can even say this, our identity is being a perfect child of God. Not because we strive to be perfect, because God has already made us so. Because when God looks at us, he doesn't see all this ugliness that we see. He doesn't see the dirtiness. He doesn't see the brokenness. He doesn't see the faults, the failures. He doesn't see any of that. He sees the righteousness of Jesus within his son and his daughter. When God looks at you, he smiles. And he says, this one is mine. That's my son. That's my daughter. That's the temple. He looks at you and he says, you are so beautiful. You are the temple of my Holy Spirit. When we talk about serving, we talk about bearing fruit. We don't serve so that God will love us. We serve because he already does. Lord, I thank you today that you call us to join you in creating good in this world and participating in the good that you are already doing. God, I thank you that you call us to join you in creating images of God all around us, that we have this opportunity to create images of God at church, at school, at work, in our neighborhood, as we shop for groceries, as we go through Walmart or wherever our day takes us. We have these opportunities to create an image of God, a little picture. Because a picture is worth a thousand words. We might not be able, we might not be able to take an hour with someone and tell them all about you and all the wonders that you've done, but we can show them in just a moment, in just the blink of an eye, in how we live how we treat each other and how we love one another. God, I pray a blessing over this house as you call us yet again on this journey with Jesus. As you look upon us yet again with a smile on your face as you say, well done. That's my boy. That's my girl. God, would you bless us yet again? Would you draw us into our identity? You are the vine. We are the branches. Help us, Lord, to live as branches today. We pray in your wonderful name. Amen this time as we close, I want to invite everybody to please stand. Let's worship together.